pastors, you know, so you're going to enjoy that, and then you're going to get into church and have a greater experience here in the sanctuary, and so it's just good. I want to encourage you guys, get your Bible in hand. Come on, let's go before the Lord together today. If you would, stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees, and let's go before the Lord together in prayer today. Father, today we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful as we come into your house that we can experience your goodness and your presence. Lord, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. And so, Father, today we don't want to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, any color we can imagine. God, we do that all the time. When we watch the news, when we read a book, Lord, when we see a movie or different things in the community, we hear from people all the time. And there's many voices and none without significance, your word says. But, Lord, today, past all that, we want to hear the one voice that matters most, and that is the voice of your Spirit speaking words to our hearts about our lives today, God. Come, Holy Spirit. You're welcome in this place. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives. Where we've gotten off track, get us back on track, Lord. We thank you, Father God, that you're moving in our lives today, God. Touch, heal, strengthen, encourage, bless. God, guard and guide and direct. Motivate us to be all that you've called us to be and to do all that you've called us to do. Lord, we thank you for it. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. We'd ask it for all the churches, all of our brothers and sisters here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, God. Denominational, non-denominational, doesn't matter, God. They're our brothers and sisters, Lord. And we bless all the churches that are preaching the gospel this day. Also, Lord, we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad in the nations, Lord. Comfort them, protect them, encourage them, strengthen them, deliver them. May they endure to the end to the glory of God. And Lord, this last week, one of the great heroes of the faith, Billy Graham, went to be with you, Lord Jesus. And God, we thank you for his life and his influence on the earth. I want to just say a special prayer for his family, for those that knew him, his loved ones, God. I pray that the comfort and the peace of the Holy Spirit be with their hearts and their lives this day. God, may we all emulate those values that he did, God. May we run our race with the integrity, God, and may we preach with the passion and the simplicity that he did, Lord. We thank you, Father God, for dividing your spirit, God, giving it and pouring it out on all flesh, Lord. And Father, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We said, amen. amen. Today, as you get your Bibles out, go with me to Colossians chapter number one. This is part number two of a mini little two-part series called The Marks of a Christian Life. Now, if you weren't with us last weekend when we opened up this series, don't worry about it. We're going to catch you right up to where we're at today. Colossians chapter number one. I just want to read a couple of verses, verse number three through verse number eight, and we'll pull out some truths as we go along and take a look at what the word of the Lord has to say to us today. Colossians chapter one, verse number three says this. It says, we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Goes on and says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. Verse 5, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel. Goes on in verse number 6 and it says, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God and truth. Verse number seven, as you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Verse number eight, who also declared to us your love in the spirit. Now, remember last time we were together, we talked about the marks that you can see in people's lives. Oftentimes, when you take a look at somebody in our society and community, that sort of a thing, you can tell who they are or maybe even what they do just by looking at them. You guys remember how we, we started talking about that there were certain people that you could tell by what they wear, what they do. So we saw the construction workers. We saw, you know, different people, and we saw different symbols as well. You remember we saw the first aid symbol that anytime you see that red cross, if you're hurting, if you're bleeding, that sort of thing, you know that you can go and get the aid that you need at that place. I have a couple more this week. But, but, you know, last week was way too easy. You got, you got those very quickly. And so I thought, I'm going to make it a little bit harder, but I'm still going to use a language that you guys all understand. In fact, some of you ladies are fluent in this language. It's the language of shoes. Is that right? Any Imelda's in the place? Okay. I'm not looking over there at my wife right now. She's, she's good. Anytime she buys a pair of shoes, I say, honey, you got to get rid of one if you're going to buy another one. We're just running out of room. No, I'm kidding. But, um, so I got a couple that I want you to see if you can figure out by the type of shoe it is, maybe who would wear it or what the function is, okay? All righty? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start you off easy, okay? Let's get that first set of shoes. There you go. Who would wear this type of shoe? Constru you see, easy, right? That's the, where we started last week, okay? I knew you guys were going to get that one easy. Let's try a different type of boot, okay? This one maybe a little bit harder. What, what kind of? I'm sorry, what? 
hiking. Pastor Joel's got jokes. He's saying Eskimo on the front row. <laughs> that might work for an Eskimo. I don't know. Okay, what, what about the next one? This one's hard. You guys ready for this? I hear basketball. What else, what else do I got? Golf. Okay, I got golf over here. Oh, and then said, so, no, 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 not golf. Don't, don't point me out, Pastor. Oh, okay, wait, wait. Chaplain. Shout it out, Chaplain. Cycling. See, he knows what it is because he uses those chaplains over there doing 50, 60 miles sometimes. That guy's crazy. Okay, so cycling shoes. You can clip into those and you can start riding. If you fall over, you better unclip fast. Otherwise, you're eating dirt. Okay, how about the next shoe? Let's see what kind of shoe this is. Okay, I heard Converse. That's the, that's the brand of shoe. What type of shoe is it? I hear casual. I hear skateboard. Uh, I, what's that? Teenager shoe? Okay, that's a good one. I heard, yesterday someone said Disneyland. Okay. Apparently they're wearing it to Disneyland. Now, these, these, these shoes are kind of confusing, aren't they? Because everybody's saying the type of shoe they are, tennis shoe, this and that shoe, but, but you know what? You're all right. Let, let's, see the, let's see it in, in application because sometimes it's kind of hard to define what something is without seeing the application. So here you've got the casual style. Is that right? This guy's dressed down. He's not dressed too impressed. You know, he, he, he's got his hair done up. I wish I could do my hair like that. I mean, that would be awesome. But look at, he's got the jeans rolled up. He's showing the socks. You know, he's got his fanny pack strapped around his chest. I don't even know. I don't even know. Okay, so he's dressed down, right? He's not dressed into a press, but the shoes, they fit that style, don't they? But what if you wanted to dress it up? Look at this guy. He's wearing a suit and some chucks. I mean, he's got to be important. Look at the way he's looking at that cell phone, you know? This guy is doing business right now. He's very smart. You see the glasses. And, and, and yet, these are dress... Wait, I thought they were casual shoes. They're dress shoes, though. See, he's, wait, you can wear them to a wedding or you could wear them in a wedding. Let's see the next picture. Look at this. Bride and groom wearing Converse All-Stars at their wedding. And this is a popular fad, by the way. This is like the thing, you know, for a lot of young people. They're, you know, I heard someone say teenagers, the, the 20-somethings and the 30-somethings that are getting married, they're doing this. See, sometimes you can't tell just by looking at something what it is. You have to see the application. You have to see how it functions. And in the Word of God in Colossians chapter number one, we saw some marks of a Christian life. Last time we were together, you remember we said that faith, love, and hope were marks of a Christian life. That you could tell someone is a Christian by their faith. You could tell that someone's a Christian if they are loving. And you can tell someone is a Christian by the hope that they have in Jesus Christ. Today, three more that I want to pull out of our text. Gospel, fruit, and ministry. Three more marks of a Christian life that maybe when you take a look at a Christian, they, they still look the same as everybody else, you know. They, they, they still are dressed and current, and you can't really tell what they are, what type they are. Even though you know the brand human, you don't know what type of human they are, right? And you're saying, are, are they Christian? Are they, are they agnostic? Are they atheist? Are they Buddhist? Are they Muslim? I mean, what, what is it? What's going on in these Christians' lives? Are they just like everybody else? Are they secular? Are they holy? What, what's going on? Well, three more marks that you can tell of a Christian life is gospel, fruit, and ministry. Let's start with gospel. First one in verse number five, Colossians chapter number one, verse number five, let's look at it together. It says this, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel. Now notice that they heard the word of truth of the gospel. This was something that was spoken, it was declared to them. They heard the gospel message, and now they are living a life that declares the gospel message. See, when the gospel gets on the inside of you, it changes you. When you have the gospel of Jesus Christ alive on the inside of you, when it, when it becomes something, when it becomes a part of you, when it, when it starts to move in your life, all of a sudden it starts to change the way that you live. And when people look at your life, they should be able to see the gospel. Now, some of you are thinking, what is the gospel? I mean, how does that work? Is it just the Bible? Is it just, you know, uh, uh, that Jesus died for our sins and was raised again to life and whoever believes on him shouldn't perish? Yes, that is the gospel message. But really, when you take a look at what gospel means, two words, two words words for our understanding today. The gospel means the good news. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the good news that guess what? God's not mad at you. That the war is over. That even though we were separated by our sin, even though we couldn't save ourselves, that God did something about it. 
We couldn't save ourselves, so God came down and he saved us. He sent Jesus to the earth, wrapped in humanity, wrapped in flesh, deity wrapped in humanity. And he died after living the perfect, spotless, sinless life. And he became the sacrificial lamb on our behalf that we didn't have to die for our sins. He died for our sins. We didn't have to take the punishment and the wrath of God on ourselves. He took it on himself there at the cross when the Father poured out his wrath and and he poured it out on Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus cried out and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, he was forsaken so that we could be accepted. He, He was condemned. Why? So that we could be justified. He took our punishment and our pain so that we could be saved and healed and whole. That is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He died in our place so we didn't have to die and go to hell. But he was raised again to life and he opened the way to the Father so that now each and every one who believes on him, who looks to that cross for their salvation and for the propitiation, the turning away of God's wrath on our behalf that satisfies the violated justice of God, when we look to that cross and when we look to Jesus at the right hand of the Father, we know assuredly that I can go. When I die, I'm going to fly away and I'm going to go and be with him forever and ever. And should he come, I'll be caught up with him in the clouds. That's good news. The good news is that you don't have to be messed up, tore up from the floor up. You don't have to be dabbling in sin and wandering around mindless and brainless and dumb and stupid and and, and just broke down, busted and disgusted any longer. You don't have to be just panning around in in the worldliness and the foolishness that we once were, the things that we're ashamed to even mention in the daylight. See, that doesn't have to be you. You don't have to be that old sinner any longer. It's good news that you can be a saint of Almighty God. That's good news. And when people listen to the voice of a Christian, they should not be wincing going, oh, not that complainer again. Oh, ah, I just hate when that person goes. No, it should be like, this person's encouraging. They've always got a good word to say. There's always something good coming out of them. See, the gospel should pour forth from our lips. It should be good news to everybody who comes around. They may not like it. They may not don't preach at me, you know. But when everybody else is getting laid off and you've got peace and you got something good to say, they're going to say, what's different about them? When the world is going to hell in a handbasket, grease lightning down a pole, straight into hell, and, and everything's falling apart, and there's wars, and everybody else is biting their fingernails, and they're wondering how they're going to make it, and what are they going to do, and you've got peace, and they say, what's different about you? Well, Jesus is coming for his own. Hey, lift up your eyes. Your redemption draws nigh when you see these things taking place on the earth. I got no problems because God's got me. And if they tear me apart, if they lop my head off, it doesn't matter. Guess what? I'm going to be with Jesus. That's good news. The economy's tanking and the stock market and the real estate market, all that kind of stuff is going downhill and everybody's losing everything. And aren't you afraid? No, God is my provider. That's good news. I don't have to worry about finances. I don't have to be afraid of what's going to happen in this stuff. Who cares? I care about the things of God, and I take care of the things of God. He'll take care of my things. God's got me. He feeds the sparrows. He clothes the flowers of the field. He's got me. God's got me. That's good news, guys. You know, we mentioned in our prayer before the message, Billy Graham has passed away this past week. He's a great man of God, probably the most notable Christian figure of our day. He evangelized hundreds of millions of people. The guy had over 300 crusades in his lifetime. Not only that, but he ran his race with integrity. He made a pact in uh, California here with uh, several other ministers. They made a pact that they wouldn't have the scandals that other ministers had. They wouldn't bring shame to the name of Jesus. And so they were going to keep themselves pure. They were going to keep their marriage bed holy. They were going to make sure that financially they were integrous and that there would be no scandals in the ministry. And he did just that. He ran his race well. And now he's with Jesus receiving his reward. And uh, there's been a lot of conversations about Billy Graham. Maybe you've seen it on social media, that sort of a thing, all the different quotes and different things that took place. And this guy was very inspirational. He's changed my life. And and even my children, uh, I I came across a little rock leadership club thing that the kids fill out. And my son, he wrote, uh, they said, who who are the the heroes? Who are the influences in your life? And parents and grandparents and that sort of thing. And I expect that out of my kids, you know, because they've got some amazing grandparents and uh, they've got some amazing parents. Hello. But then he wrote Jimmy Graham, and I know he just forgot the name. It was Billy Graham. But the very fact that he would choose someone like that just blessed me that here's a man that he doesn't even know, never heard a sermon from, 
hasn't been to one of his crusades, any of that kind of stuff, and yet he's still influencing the generations that are coming. And Kathy Lee Gifford was on uh, Megyn Kelly's show this past week, and she had some things to say, but I want you to listen specifically for how the gospel poured forth from Billy Graham's life. Check out the overheads. Kathy Lee Gifford joins me now. She was a close friend of Billy Graham. Kathy, great to see Still you. Still am. <laughs> what, what's your reaction? What are you thinking about Oh, my, today? they came in to tell me I was in makeup over across the street, and I just immediately just put up my hands and said, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Because he has been... Uh, lingering and languishing. Uh, I, last time I saw him was four years ago at his 95th birthday party. And uh, Frank was alive then too, and we went down there. And, and I was sitting with his granddaughter at a, at, a, um, at a table and hadn't seen him, and he was quite frail. But I, I knew it, in my heart it would be the last time I'd see him. So I said to her, I said, can I go over and just, just tell your, your grandfather thank you? Because my whole family came to faith in Jesus through the Billy Graham organization. Is that right? Yes, and I personally did, going to the first movie that the Billy Graham organization ever put out. It was called The Restless Ones. And it's like God met me in my heart right where I lived. I wanted to be an actress. So where does God meet me? In a movie theater. And at that time, he took a lot of flack for even making a movie. See, I, but, but I, I find that what... so interesting because you, you had the same philosophy as he did, which he used to say, he used to preach about the joy, the joy of Absolutely. belief. Absolutely. That sounds like you. And what just happened for Billy happened for my husband, happened for my mother, for my father. Everybody that dies in Christ goes immediately into the arms of Christ for eternity. That is the hope of the Christian faith. Yes, it gives us the tools we need to live in the world today while we're alive. But that's why I could hold my dead husband in my arms and rejoice because I knew where he was mm -hmm. and it gives you the peace that passes all understanding and if we don't have if we've ever needed peace in this world we need it now somebody says to me why are you so bold about your faith and I was look at everybody's beautiful face right now you too <laughs> I said why are you so bold about your faith and I said you know what if you had the cure for cancer would you keep it quiet or would you hold it and keep it a secret and I always say I have the cure for the malignancy of the soul. And he has a name, and it's Jesus. And if you just receive, I talked somebody off a cliff this morning on Twitter at 4.30 this morning, because he says, how do I know you're Jesus? How can I get to know you're Jesus? And it just, it, I feel so privileged to be able to share just the good news. Gospel means good news. It's good news. And I'm not talking about a religion. I'm talking about a relationship with the living God. They're so different. They're so different. We don't need more religion. We need more Jesus. There aren't that many Billy Grahams out there. There are world. so many people of faith, though, that, and, and sincere faith, and uh, many, many, many in our pulpits, but many, many, many just, it might be your plumber. It might be. God has his people everywhere. And, and use this opportunity to look into your own heart, every one of us should, and say, do I have a malignancy of my soul? Where's the doctor? Well, the good news is the doctor is in. Mm -hmm. And um, he conquered death for all time for every one of us. And it's free. It's probably the only thing in this whole world we live in that's completely free. Mm -hmm. This broken man on Twitter this morning said, you know, I, I've disappointed everybody. I'm a, I'm a mess. I'm a, I'm a this, I'm a that. I said, I, I, I'm a burden to everybody. And I said, you're not a burden to God and you're not a burden to me. And God loves you. Just ask him into your heart and you can, your life will change. It can be your plumber. It can be your coworker. I <laughs> love you, Megan. Love you. I love that. She, she says, there's not many Billy Grahams out there, but she says, but there are so many people of faith. It could be your plumber or it could be your neighbor. It could be you, and it could be me. See, when the gospel pours forth from our lives, it's attractive. It's something that shows who we are, but also it brings the light to a lost and dying world, just like Billy Graham, just like Kathy Lee, and just like you, and just like me. The gospel should be pouring forth from our lives. Can you say amen today? God is good. Second thing is this. Second thing after the gospel we saw in our text is fruit. The one of the marks of every Christian's life should be fruit. Let's take a look once again at verse number six, if you will, in Colossians chapter number one. Colossians chapter one, verse number six says this, which has come to you, speaking about how the gospel has come to them, as it has also in all 
the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Now, notice he says that they heard the word of the gospel, right? But they also heard the truth that came with it, and that truth has power. Grace is God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. So when they heard the gospel, the gospel is a seed that has the power within itself to produce after its own kind. So not only will the gospel produce words, not only will it produce the the language, the gospel coming out of our mouths, but also it will come out of our lives. It will produce fruit. See, the Apostle Paul had never been to the Colossian church to see for himself. He had been to Ephesus, which was a ways away from that, but people from Colossae and from Iconium and Lystra and the different places around had heard his ministry, and they went back. Probably Epaphras, the one who he calls a faithful minister, had gone and he had planted that church in Colossae. And so here they are, and how did the Apostle Paul know that they were Christians? He knew because of their faith, because of their love, because of their hope, because the gospel was pouring out of them, and also because they were bearing forth fruit, just like everybody else all over the world. Now, sometimes we wonder and we say, well, wait a second. Okay, so God wants fruit to come out of our lives. Does that just mean getting people saved? Yes, that does mean getting people saved. That is part of the fruitfulness of a Christian's life is that we will be soul winners, and that will be fruit that comes into the kingdom of God. That's part of the fruitful life. But it doesn't stop there. It's not just about being a soul winner because sometimes we, if we look at that and that's the only indicator, we could get discouraged because in our lives we're working hard, we've got our family time, that sort of thing, and maybe during the year you get to share your faith a couple of times and no one got saved. And you say, well, wait a second, am I a fruitful Christian then? Am I bearing forth any fruit? I haven't got anyone saved in a while and I, I just don't know what's going on, Lord, and, and maybe I've disappointed God. But listen, there is more fruit to be had than just getting people saved, even though that's a great fruit. Let's take a look at it in the book of Galatians, chapter number five. If you want to turn back through Philippians, towards the front of your Bible, you'll find Ephesians, and then before that, you'll find Galatians. And in Galatians chapter five, we're going to read verse number 22 and verse number 23. The Apostle Paul's writing the church of Galatia this time, and he's talking to them about what takes place when you walk in the flesh versus walking in the spirit. When you walk in the flesh, the things that take place coming out of the flesh are evident. Anger, malice, wrath, striving, fornications, lust, uncleanness, drunkenness, all these things, right? And then he goes on, and he says this in verse number 22 of Galatians chapter 5. He says, but the fruit of the spirit is love. Remember, that's one of those marks that we talked about joy, that, that when you take a look at a Christian's life, they may not be, you know, like Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. I'll give them that, you know, for the moment that you're actually on the ride and you see your kids with their hands up and the wind's blowing in their hair as you're going around in a circle on Dumbo and they're making you sick going up and down. That's happiness, all right? Yeah, but it's temporary and it's manufactured. You know, I couldn't tell you all the happy moments I've had at Disneyland. I could tell you all the crazy moments I've had when my, my child had a full-blown level five meltdown and they were rolling on the ground and everybody's walking by staring at him going, what's wrong with that kid, you know? I could tell you that. I could show you that patch of concrete. I could show you where my kids messed up their, their diaper and it went all the way up their back and we had to go and buy new clothes. I could show you all that stuff, all right? I can remember all those things. Why? Because you pay a lot of money to go stand in a line for a little minute of happiness on a ride, and then they call that the happiest place on earth. I'll give them that. But the church of the Lord God Almighty, the church of Jesus Christ, we have the King within us, and we have joy that surpasses circumstances doesn't matter what's going on externally, internally. I've got a joy that pours forth from my life. I've got a smile on my face. Why? Because Jesus is alive, and I get to be with him forever. And I've got the joy of the Lord, which is my strength. It says not only love and joy, but look at this, peace. Peace. You could be in the midst of a storm. Everything's falling down around you, and you are like a solid rock. Why? Because you've got the peace of the Spirit living on the inside of you. It goes on to say long-suffering, kindness, goodness. See, those are things that take place when people look at your life and they say, why are you put up with that? Here's the reason why, because I'm in the Spirit right now. I'm walking in the Spirit. Walk means to live out your life. You can live out your life in the flesh, and when things frustrate you and people don't do what you think they should be doing, you can give them what for. You can give them a piece of your mind or the back of your hand. But listen, when you're a Christian and when you're walking in the Spirit, living out your life in the Spirit, now all of a sudden you can be long-suffering. You can put up with a whole lot more. And guess what? While you're suffering long, you can be kind and you can be gentle with people. Faithfulness or other translations, just say faith. You know, there's something that comes on a Christian when you're in the Spirit that you can just believe God. 
that it doesn't shake you, that you can't be brought off of the things that you're believing God for. You have faith. Why? Because you're walking in the Spirit. Gentleness and self-control. When people look at your life, they should see that you're submitted to the will and the Word of God. These are fruit that pour forth from a Christian's life. And when people see your life, they should say, that's a Christian because I see them bearing fruit. Look how gentle they are. Look how kind they are. Look how long-suffering they are. My goodness, look how tempered they are, self-controlled. When everybody else is diving in, you're standing back saying, no, I'm not going to go and do that. When everybody else wants to have a gossip fest, you're like, I'm not going to talk about them. When everybody else wants to put down our leadership, can I meddle in your business for a second? Because we think we can say whatever we want to online and that there's no accountability. No, the Bible says for every idle word, we will be brought into account. And therefore, when everybody else is saying everything they want to say about our governor, about our president and vice president, about the Congress or the House of Representatives, about our court judges, man, listen, I'm told to pray for that person. I'm told to respect and honor the king and to serve all men. I'm not jumping in with you. See, when people see your self-control, that temperance, that, that, that submission to the things of God, they should say, that's a real Christian. See, one of the biggest deterrents to people becoming Christians is that they don't see our words or our beliefs line up with our actions. But if they see it line up, then they'll know that's the mark of a Christian. So the question comes along, then how do I bear fruit? If God wants me to be fruitful, do I have to work hard at this? Do I, do I have to produce this? Listen, any tree, you don't see them like, mm, you know, yeah, and then finally the fruit pops. They, they, they don't. What do they do? They sit there. They receive, and then they produce. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't factors and things that you can do, but look at what Jesus says in John, the 15th chapter, okay? This is where your effort should go to. If you want to be a fruitful Christian, this is where your effort should go to. John chapter number 15, Jesus uses a parable. He talks about a vineyard. He talks about vines. He talks about fruit because he says that the Father wants us to bear much fruit. Oh, now the pressure's on, isn't it? But look at what Jesus says in John chapter 15. I would encourage you, we don't have time to read all of the verses in John chapter 15. Just take some time this week, maybe sit down with a notepad and a pen and just let the Spirit of God speak to you from John chapter number 15. It'll just bless your life. And especially if you want to be a fruitful Christian, which I know you all do, you will just be blessed by John chapter number 15. We're going to take a look at verse number four and verse number five. Look at what Jesus says. He says, abide in me and I in you. Abide in me. And I in you. Now, what does it mean to abide? Abide means to live, to stay, and to dwell in. Just like we talked about walk, live out your life in. Jesus is saying, I want you to live. I want you to stay. I want you to dwell. That means don't move from this position. Where? In me. And I in you. Next part of the verse says this. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me. So Jesus is saying something. He's saying the branch doesn't do this on its own. If you cut a branch off of a tree, it will never bear fruit. If you cut a branch off the vine, it will never produce anything. But it's only in that connection. See, that vine doesn't produce because of external forces. It's not because of the air or the water that's around it in the air. It's not because of any of those things. It doesn't happen because of those things. It happens because the ground has water and nutrients in the soil that the, the, the trunk of that plant carries up through that trunk and pushes out into the branches. And as those branches have a good solid connection, it's what's going on internally that produces the fruit externally. Are you listening today? So when you stay connected to Jesus, it's not the external forces you're, you're working so hard at it because people are going to frustrate you. Things aren't going to go the way that you want them to. You're not always going to have perfect circumstances. Those external forces isn't what's going to make the difference. What's going to make the difference is the Spirit of God living on the inside of you that you stay connected to. Regardless of external circumstances, the internal realities will produce fruit in your lives. Can somebody say amen today? Verse number five, look at what it says. John chapter 15, verse number five. I am the vine. Jesus makes it clear who he is and what he's doing. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Not just a little fruit. Bears much fruit. Not just a couple of fruit. Bears much fruit. You got to get a hold of this, guys, because the more you stay connected to Jesus, the more fruit you produce. The more you walk in the Spirit... 
the more your life will be a fruitful life. Look what he says, for without me, you can do nothing. We can't do this on our own, guys. We need the life-giving power of the Spirit of God living on the inside of us, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. As you live, stay, and dwell in Him, it will be the mark that changes your life, that produces much fruit. Last one for today is this, is ministry. Gospel, fruit, and ministry. Now, I want you to notice something. Ministry comes last in this order because it starts with the gospel, then it goes to fruitfulness, and then finally it goes to ministry. You know what? God always develops the minister before he develops the ministry, okay? What God does on the inside of you should be coming out of your life. And if we're going to have the mark of a Christian life in our ministry, it has to come from that connection to the Spirit of God because without him, we can do nothing. Now, sometimes we get the wrong idea about ministry. We think that it's just about the people that are paid by the church. It's only about those that, that, you know, have a paid position at the church. But that is not the ministry. Let's take a look at it in Colossians, once again, chapter number one. And this time I want you to take a look at verse number seven, okay? Turn back with me to Colossians chapter number one. And let's look at verse number seven this time. Colossians chapter one, verse number seven says this. He says, as you also learn from the Epaphras, our dear fellow servant. Everybody say servant. Okay, that wasn't everybody. Let's try that again. Our dear fellow servant. Everybody say servant. Okay, now that word could also be translated slave. And not just a, 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 a house slave, lower level, bottom of the rung, right? This, this was somebody who was a, a, a bond servant, you'll find it oftentimes in the Bible. So he says, Epaphras, our fellow servant or our fellow slave. And it goes on in the next part of the verse and it says this, who is a faithful minister, everybody say minister, minister. of the gospel of Christ on your behalf, of Christ on your behalf. So he says, a fellow servant and fellow Minister, faithful minister, fellow servant, and faithful minister. Oftentimes in the Bible, you will find those words paired up together. Servant or slave and minister. Now, minister has a couple of different applications in the Bible. Let me share with you what they are. You will find minister for people like Epaphras, okay? For people who were in the ministry in a church setting, okay? These were people who had positions in the church. Oftentimes pastors or deacons or elders, you'll see them uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the different translations. People who had some sort of authority in the church world, in the church realm, in the church organization, and they call them ministers, okay? So this was used of people. This is also used in the broader sense of the body of Christ. And then the final application is this was used for, are you ready for this? Table waiters. Think about that for a second. It's used for the general population of the body of Christ, for the people who are selected to be a part of the organization of church leadership, and of table waiters. They were called ministers. Here's the reason why we get hung up on the ministry, and we think it's only for the people that are paid by the church, because we don't understand what ministry is. Let me define ministry for you. I think it'll make this evidently and abundantly clear to all of us what ministry is all about. Ministry is simply this, service for people. That is the definition of ministry right there, is service for people. See, now it makes sense, doesn't it, that pastors, the general population of the body of Christ, and table waiters would be serving people. See, in the Bible, they didn't have restaurants like we have today. They couldn't go down to KFC and get them a bucket of chicken. They could not go down to, uh, you know, IHOP and get some pancakes. They couldn't do any of that kind of stuff. The, the, the servants, the table waiters, were often for the elite. They were for the rich and the wealthy. And, and you'll see Jesus using parables about a rich man, a wealthy man, a, a landowner, a vineyard owner, that sort of a thing. Uh, the master of the house, oftentimes you remember in the parables. And he had table waiters that would come and they would wait on him. He had servants and slaves that they would come and they would wait on him. You know, we, we oftentimes think of a servant or a table waiter in, in this sort of elite setting as somebody who's got the towel over their arm, right? And they, they're standing up straight and they've got a suit and a tie on and, and they're very structured and they come. And I remember one time, the first time I had a, a, a really nice meal, I should say it that way. I've had nice meals, but I didn't ever have a really nice meal. I, I got taken out by a friend and they were treating me and a bunch of other people. And so I sat down at the table. I remember I went to go and grab my napkin and put it over my lap. Before I could get it, there was a dude next to me in a suit. He snapped that thing and all of a sudden he whipped it right across my nap, my lap. And it like laid down as like a parachute, like a blanket just covered. And I just thought, oh my gosh, I'm in another realm. I had pate for the very first time. I didn't even know what it was. I still don't know what it is. 
I think they blended up a goose and put it into a little form and then just like took that little circle and put it on my plate. It was delicious. I don't know what it was, but I ate it. It was amazing. But see, here's the deal. For all of us, we need to understand that ministry is just simply service for people. Sometimes people look at pastoring as glamorous. They look at the working for the church as this wonderful thing. Ask any of our staff, this is not sexy, you guys. This is not glamorous. There are things that we deal with on the back end that we are like, man, I could go and make some more money in the world and not have these problems. You know what I'm saying? Because, because it's, it's not always easy. It's not always clean. You know, life is messy. And when you're serving people, you're going to serve issues that people have. And in our day and age, the issues are getting greater and greater. Just talk to anybody who's been in a Breaking Free dinner and has listened to the, the letters that have been written. Service for people. When you start serving people, people got issues. People can be messed up sometimes. People don't always make the right decisions. And when you're serving people, you're now giving of yourself, and you're now laying down your life, and you're waiting at a table for somebody else. Come on, are you listening today? See, that's what the higher up you go in the Christian organization, the more of a servant you become. You know how I know that? Because find the top-level executive, the CEO of the organization. What's his name? Oh, that was weak. Did you guys leave today? Listen, hold on. I do not pastor a quiet church. This is the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. This is the place, this is the loud section of heaven. Is that right? I said this is the loud section. We're going to be in the loud section of heaven. Okay? And when, when I'm preaching good, y'all need to talk to me, okay? You guys got to help me preach this sermon, okay? Because the, the more brain dead you are, the more you sit there and soak into lethargy and apathy, when you walk out of this place, you're going to say, that wasn't very good. Pastor Dan really didn't do a good job at the message today. I don't think I'm going to go back to that church, you know? I'm just not getting fed spiritually. No, it's because you were stupid and you sat there brain dead and you didn't get a hold of the Word of God, and the devil's going to knock you out when you get out into the parking lot. But if you help me preach today, if you get involved in it today, if you don't just spectate, but you participate, you're going to walk out of this church and slap yourself and say, man, that was good. I need to get some more of that. I better come back tonight and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Man, I got to get a hold of that. And your life's going to change. And the devil comes around, you're going to kick him in the rear right out of your house. So who is the top-level CEO executive of the Christian organization? What's his name? Jesus. Jesus said, I came as one who serves. He wrapped himself in a towel and washed his disciples dirty, nasty, grubby, corns, feet. And listen, they didn't have Nikes and all that kind of stuff. They didn't even have Tevas in their day. They, they had some leather, and they were walking through animal poop, and they were walking through the mud and the dust. You can imagine how dirty these fishermen's feet were. And, and here Jesus is taking their dirt on himself. Come on, somebody. He took the lowest level position even though he has the highest position of authority. The higher up you go in the Christian organization, the more of a servant you become. Jesus said it like this, you want to be great in the kingdom? You must become slave of all. See, ministry is not glamorous. It's not the pulpit. It's not any of that stuff. You are a full-time minister. You are a servant for the people. And when people get around you, they should say, ooh, my goodness, they just served up something good right now. You ever been to a restaurant where you just got blown away by the service? I remember my wife and I, one time we went to Chili's here in San Bernardino. Anybody like Chili's? Okay, yeah, pretty good stuff, right? And, and so we were there, and, and uh, we were having lunch. And this guy, I remember, do you remember this, Pastor Jess? She doesn't remember, okay? But I, do, I remember this guy. He was the white guy, beard, glasses, little, little, little stocky. And man, this guy knew how to serve. He, he had our drinks. But, you know, I have my little, my little things that I do. Like when the cup starts getting low and I want to refill, I kind of shake it a little bit. Because hopefully my, my, sir, my, my waiter will hear the sound of the ice and go, I think Pastor Dan needs a refill. I sense a disturbance. You know you do it. You're up there like sucking the straw, hoping that they hear. Really wish someone would get me a refill on my Pepsi because they didn't have Coke. Before I could shake the cup, the dude had a refill. I was like, man, that's good. That's good. 
That's awesome. Man, he came out. I remember we, we ordered a little appetizer, some chips and salsa. He had that stuff coming out. Before I grabbed the last little crumbs of chips, he had some new chips out there. Hot, piping hot, salted to perfection, man. It was so good. He brought our food out. There was something wrong with the order. He just passed it by. said, I'll be right back. Guess what? He was right back. He had our food in order. He said, I'm so sorry that I had to do that. This, this is the, they, they gave me the wrong order, but I saw it. This is the right order. He had it there. We were, we were eating. He's like, are you guys ready for the check? Still munching? What do you need? You know what I'm like? And I'm like, dude, you're awesome, you know? And I remember we, we wrote on the, the, the check, I wrote a big tip. I wasn't going to give him no 10%, 18%, 15%. No, not 20 I was like 30% for this dude. He's, he's just on it, right? And I wrote right underneath that, God bless you, just in case he's a believer and that will encourage him. Or if he's a non-believer, maybe that'll soften his heart towards something. You know what I'm saying? Don't be cheap. You want to be a witness? Don't be cheap. Serve somebody. We went away that day. I ate more than I should have ate because of how good this guy was. And I was poorer because of how good this guy was. See, when people get around your life and you start to serve them, when you start to lay down your life for others, when you become that lower level slave and you take people's dirt on yourself, see, now all of a sudden it changes the world that they live in. People should live your live and, 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 and leave you fuller than when they can. They shouldn't leave poorer, though. They should leave richer because they were in your presence. You know what I'm saying? Because that's what the mark of a true Christian really is. You guys are preaching good now. Amen. I'll give you an amen. Others should live our lives, leave our lives fuller than when they came. The marks of a Christian, faith, love, hope. What did we learn today? What was the first one? Gospel. What was the second one? Fruit. And finally, ministry. See, you guys got some from the word today. Give God a great big praise today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Word of God just gets better and better in this place. Amen. Amen. Hey, I want to share with you guys before you leave. No one get up. No one leave during this time. We're not done yet. Church is not out. we got a couple more things we want to do. I want to just share with you a quick testimony from the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. Um, you know, we have a, a food distribution center. We feed over a half million people all their groceries every year, and that happens both here on campus as well as in the ministries that we supply food for. Over 50 ministries get all their food from us, and then they distribute it to other places. This has been a neat thing, and we, we have a, a semi-tractor truck trailer, and we have a dry trailer as well as a cold trailer they were able to take meats and cheeses and frozen goods and all that kind of stuff and so just really neat we also have a box truck and lately our box truck's been giving us some problems and we've been having to do repairs and you know after a while that stuff adds up and so Brian uh, had seen Brian is um, over our food distribution center and he had seen that there was going to be an auction coming up so he asked can I go and just see what they got you know, and see if we can replace this. We've been looking for a truck with a lift that would help us out a lot um, and maybe just go see what's going on. And so we said, yeah, go check it out. You know, so he found a couple trucks there that he liked. One of them was a flatbed. In fact, we got some pictures of them. Let's put those up. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see there's a new box truck there, uh, it, new to us, okay? So 1990s and has over 100,000 miles on it, but it's still better than what we got. And you can see the lift on the back. And then on the other side, uh, that is a flatbed truck in the back there. They call that a steak truck. And so you can put uh, pallets and things like that on there. And so Brian saw both of these, and he said, hey, I'd like to put some bids in. What do you think? And we said, well, you know what? We don't want to spend a lot of money, well, you know, budget needs and all that kind of stuff. So if we got these trucks for maybe, you know, 2000 bucks a piece, that would be, don't you think that's good, right? Used, used car, a truck like this, you think you get that for $2,000? Not on a lot, you can't, right? So here we're at an auction, so we're, we said, just max it $2,000, okay? But, but, you know, see what, see what you can do. You know, maybe you can come in lower. Maybe you can save some money. So Brian, he's praying, you know, and Brian is, is just an awesome man of God, so he's praying about it. And so the one on the right-hand side there, the steak truck, he was able to get that one for $1,300. That's pretty good, isn't it? Now, if that wasn't enough, Brian said the one on the left, he just did not feel peace about putting in a high bid. He just felt like, I need to, I, I can't go. And he said, Pastor, I couldn't get over it. I just, I had this number in my mind, and so I just wrote it down. You know what he wrote down? They accepted it too, by the way, $500. Are you kidding me? We got both of them for what we were willing to pay for one of them. That's God moving on our behalf. Isn't that cool? Now, why do I tell you this testimony? Because number one, it's cool. This is what we're doing. And we're able to take care of more needs and more people and that sort of a thing. But also, because if God can do that for the church, for the organization, you know, the church is not the church. The church is the 501c3. We are the Rock Church World Outreach Center, all that kind of stuff. That's great. But the real church is each and every one of us in these seats today. We are the church. 
And if God's willing to do that so that we can take care of the needs of people, how much more does God want to do in your life financially? What do you believe in God for? What, what do you got on the line? What is it that you want to do for God? Maybe you're saying, man, I really would like to bring a 30th birthday miracle offering. Man, what do you believe in God for? Maybe you're saying, I, I'd like to just prosper and be more generous with, with people in my life. Maybe, maybe there's something that you want to buy a house. Those are wonderful things. Maybe you got that gift of hospitality and you would just love to invite people over and, and cook them a meal and, and use that as a, as a blessing to believers and a witness to unbelievers. Whatever it is that's on your, on your heart to do, let's believe God. Let's bring our tithes and our offerings and watch what God does. Once again, no one leave during this time. Let's stand to our feet.